And all right, so welcome to our January COP and happy new year to all of those I haven't talked to or emailed with yet. It's good to have you on the call. Um, before we get started, uh, just in, in way of an announcement, we want to let you know that the OSTC team has made the decision that the conference will be all virtual uh, this year. And that some of the things that we thought we knew are in flux at this point. So um, they're, they're still working out the details and making decisions. And uh, hopefully we'll hear more soon. Stay tuned for, for any updates about that. Um, with that out of the way, we, I want to introduce uh, Kathy and Michelle. Um, you can hopefully see them. They're going to work with us today and, and help us understand a few things. Um, both of them have had a chance to participate in the STEM Eco Project, um, which is uh, funded through the National Science Foundation under project number 1657015. Um, now I have those technicalities out of the way. Um, we, can, we can almost dive into, but we have four little components that we want to talk about um, of things that, that they have learned through this project, but that really overlap with the work we're doing in YTP and that we feel are important for our transition specialists to, to hear about, learn about, think about, and hopefully explore as we dive into, um, into this topic of uh, school-based uh, opportunities for students. Um, so we'll talk a few minutes and, and um, both Michelle and, and Kathy will present for a few minutes each on, on different parts here. Uh, we'll talk about um, CIS, um, then we'll talk about some hidden STEM pathways, career pathways. Um, we'll talk about partnering with new or existing CTE programs in school districts. And then we'll uh, hopefully have time to touch on community mapping for a few minutes. And they'll give us a short introduction to each of these topics. And then we'll have a few minutes to just open it up for questions and discussion before we jump on to the next thing. So with that being said, Michelle, why don't you take things over and start talking about CIS? So um, I first wanted to start with, I know, I know that um, not every school has Oregon CIS, um, but I do know that if your school does not buy a license, uh, a license agreement um, to Oregon CIS, you can typically access the um, uh, login and, and uh, um, the database itself through your employment department, through your voc rehab offices. Um, the community colleges also have access to. So if it becomes an issue trying to find out how to get a whole, how to access CIS, uh, maybe discuss it first with your TNF and, and see if they can point you down the right direction, but feel free to, to contact me too. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you now. And my goal today is not to um, teach you everything that there is or introduce you to everything that there is to know about CIS, uh, but just some of the basic tools that, that we use. Um, my number one suggestion would be to play around with it, to take um, the time to take the assessments yourself before giving them to students, um, understand how to use um, CIS and, and sort of play around with it for a little bit before um, you know, sitting down with your YTP kiddos. Uh, when you, can you see my screen okay? Yes. So when you log into CIS, you're gonna have three basic sections. You're gonna have your dashboard, um, which is where everything that you save and have participated in is stored. Um, and so that's really important. I introduce it to students um, as a backpack or a binder, a place to keep your things, a file cabinet. Um, your career plan guide is gonna be those assignments that your school um, uh, asks students to complete. For today, we're gonna spend a majority of our time under Explore Resources. Um, under the Explore Recess Resources tab, um, you're gonna find a lot of, of really cool things that you can do with students. I, I typically spend a lot of my time under the occupations um, section. So if you go um, into explore resources and occupations, you're gonna find a lot of um, interest inventories and career assessments that you can do with students. The cool thing about these um, activities are that um, they help students really look at their own interests and value systems and then they ask them questions um, based on their interests and their values, and they connect the um, students' answers or the output to careers that um, might be interesting to them or have a shared value system. Um, and so 
Um, I typically will walk students through several of these activities, um, but uh, maybe not all of them. It depends on the student. It depends on um, how much time we have and where they're at on their career development. Um, and Kathy, please feel free to add if anything at any time. Um, what's also really great about these is you can print your results, you can share your results with IEP teams, um, with your VR counselor. Um, but most importantly, the student gets a pretty good comprehensive um, uh, portfolio of assessment results. Um, and we're going to do Q&A, I believe, at the end of, of this. So if you have questions, please feel free to, to put it in the chat or let us know. Um, I also use this same tool when I'm writing my plans for employment. And so um, it's not uncommon for me to go into an occupational, click on an occupational list. Um, you can sort these careers um, or occupations by um, STEM categories, yes or no. You can sort them by wages, by cluster, all kinds of different tools. But for the most part, what I typically do is I use the alphabetical list. And so I'll look for, um, I'll help a student find their career um, interest area or their employment goal area underneath these um, alphabetical tabs. Um, and then from there, uh, we do some career planning um, or even some basic employment planning, you know, for some of those first jobs. Um, but typically a lot of um, the information that I put into my plans for employment come from these areas. So like, let's say a student wanted to be um, an animal caretaker. Just, I'm just pulling one randomly out of, out of there. Um, they can find a lot of information about being an animal caretaker um, from this section, um, anywhere from, um, you know, what are the skills and abilities that one would need to be an animal caretaker? Um, and if this was a, an employment goal of a student of mine, I would <laughs> spend a lot of time. Um, going through these uh, different sections and discussing where are our needs, where are our barriers, right? Where does a student shine and, and where are they really strong and where might we be um, putting some assistive technology supports, some job coaching supports, um, where might there be some deficits or barriers for um, a student depending on, on their, them, their self, themselves and their, um, their employment goals. Sorry about that. How much time do we have? I'm gonna give about two, two more minutes. Two more minutes, okay. Um, and so you can do anything from uh, helpful high school courses, which is also something that um, we spend a lot of time looking at um, when exploring STEM careers is, is what um, CTE and STEM classes do we have in high school that might help a student connect to a career they're interested in in that area. How can we help a student um, further their knowledge and their experience while still in high school. Um, you can also look at um, the uh, physical demands, working conditions, really what's that work environment look like, if, especially if you're concerned about environmental um, barriers that could possibly be um, standing in the student's way. You can look at hiring practices and preparation, um, licensing and certification. So what um, certifications would one need to be able to do this type of job? Is that something that is supported by our employment department funders, right? So you can even look to see if a career has typically been funded by Voc Rehab, by DHS, by, um, by WorkSource. And so um, I love Oregon CIS, the occupational list, as a way of not only helping students explore their careers, but also helping them to write that plan for employment with their team. Any so anything else you want to add, Kathy? No, I was just going to say after the well, where Brookings and Corbett first start is always CIS with the assessment, and then we move on to when do you do assessments? We're going to move to doing them in eighth grade. Um, we start as a school district in eighth grade, but a majority of them are done freshman and sophomore year. But it's mm -hmm. not uncommon for me to get a junior or a senior mm -hmm. and redo assessments. Right. One, exactly. they may, yeah, they may not have taken them very seriously when they're in eighth or ninth grade, or their lives have changed a lot. They might be more impacted by a disability. They might have had a completely different career um, interest area, kind of, you know, light a fire under them. 
Um, and so sometimes I will redo an assessment um, if a student hasn't done it in a long time. Thanks, Michelle and Kathy. And by the way, I forgot to mention, Kathy is coming to us today from the uh, LA airport. She's stuck there in transit. Um, so there might be a little bit of weird background noise as we uh, ask for, for your um, patience and grace in dealing with those. Um, going back to this, any questions you have for Michelle or Kathy? I didn't get a chance to show you the um, IPE template. Would you like me to put that up there really quick, just it, just to show it? Sure. Okay. Um, so I have a um, a sample template, and I'm gonna um, go ahead and send that on to um, Garrett, and then you guys are welcome to use it. But um, basically, it's it's um, who we're writing the IPE for, um, what plan number it is, because sometimes we write more than one, or we adjust it depending on the student, um, the employment goal. Um, and that is, again, uh, what I would then take and look in CIS to find some of the um, labor market research and skills and abilities. This information right here comes from, um, from the client informational narrative. So before I write a plan for employment with a student and with the VR counselor, um, I make sure that the student has, um, in their own words, answered these questions. Um, I kind of do it as a homework assignment, and then we go over it together. Um, and then I work with the student to put that information into these um, sections. The transferable skills and um, characteristics, that's where I'm gonna really look at those skills and abilities in CIS. Um, what does the um, occupation require? What would this um, the student need to be able to know and do um, on the job site? And then also the labor market information. And the really cool thing about CIS is you can look um, in your local towns, in your local regions, but you can look across the state and nationally at a lot of this data as well. Um, so if students want to go somewhere else or move somewhere else, um, that you can help them compare and look at that research. And then the plan services. So I try to get as much information to my VR counselor, um, parents, student, like all of us on the same page before I'm asking the VR counselor to spend a ton of time writing this plan. I'm gonna ask the student and the parent and the employer, what are some of those things, those big things that we're gonna need to provide for the student? Whether it's non-slip shoes um, or a, um, right now I've got Chrysler wanting some certifications for a student working at the auto, uh, at the auto um, sales uh, department. And so um, we do that research and then we put this into a template and share it with the VR counselor. And when we're staffing students and writing plans for employment, it gives us great um, information to, to begin that process. And remember, oh, I can't talk. Oh. Remember, um, everyone, that that's how Michelle works with her VR counselor. Some of you may have a little different, um, the work that she has and helps with Lane being able to do the plan is wonderful. Some of you aren't expected to go into that detail, but to be thinking of all those things, what's gonna be needed and how VR um, can help support that student are all those different things. Absolutely, it's also important to let the student and the parents know that just because we're working on this template doesn't mean we're gonna get everything we ask for, that this is a, there's an approval process but it does help us have a lot less, I feel like negotiations when we're sitting at the table with, with VR and even the HSA, um, my VR counselor's HSA has um, a little bit more information. Like here's the vendor, here's the size, here's the quantity, here's all the things that we think we're gonna need um, to make it faster. Right. So after we do CIS and we assess the students, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happens within the school from the school into the community. So um, in the school, we talk about um, hidden STEM in the school. So every single class that the student takes, we try to make that meaningful to the student for their um, competitive integrated employment at the end of their path. So we talk about how math, science, culinary, woodshop, any CTE course they take, anything that they do relates to their final path of employment. And we start with CIS. And then we work with the student to understand what classes they're going to take in high school off of that assessment that's going to benefit them to get to their long-term 
integrated employment. So okay. just just before you dive fully into this, we have one more question, I think that goes back to to Michelle's part. Uh, Barb, why don't you speak up? Maybe. Thank you. <laughs> I think you can hear me now. Um, I just wanted to bring up and listening to um, that part of the presentation. I think that just for collaboration purposes, it would be very helpful, at least from my standpoint as a VRC, to have um, that meeting shared with what those needs are um, uh, shared with the VRC so we can be looking at those together before. I mean, I think that it's great to go ahead and get an idea in advance of what um, that is going to be needed, but I think that it's very, very important to have that talk with the VRC prior to having that group meeting so there's not expectations that occur because Michelle is right. You know, we, we can't always um, say beforehand what we're going to be able to do and what we're not going to be able to do. And that is, you know, each VRC and the student and the YTP specialist will sit down and they will collaborate and create that plan. But it's it's very, very important for us to kind of have a heads up. So we're not always labeled the bad guy. Oh, VR won't give us that or, you know, VR is not going to provide this because it's not part of their policy. That way we have an open you know, collaboration going. And I think that's really important. Thank you, Barb. You're correct. And you also want to make sure if you have other partners <clears throat> serving the student. So um, if a student has an ISP plan through DD services, you want to make sure that those providers are also involved in the conversation, especially if you're expecting them to cover a service after you and VR have um, exited the student from your services. So it's definitely individualized and depends on the student. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Kathy, now you may go ahead. So we're going to talk about how we get our staff to buy into teaching the hidden STEM within the school district. So ways that we do it is one of the ways we do is we have something called AUA, which teachers can attend anywhere in the state of Oregon, you can attend it. It's stands for accessing union apprenticeships. And during this time, the different unions and trades talk about how every single class in school benefits them in a CTE or a trades or a STEM job at the end of the path. So um, I know Michelle, you went to it um, last year. You actually you've gone two years, I think. I've been involved with it for three years and the buy-in to our staff, once they go to that AUA and they understand that every single class is meaningful, we have our students now buying in. We don't have as many absences. We see that um, they're starting to get excited about the classes that they're attending because they see their end goal. So something like uh, Corbett has always been an AP school. So we have not jumped into the STEM jobs or the CTE jobs as much as other schools until we got involved in the in this NSF grant. And what happened is once we started getting involved in it, we made a team at our school that helped drive this forward. The ways that we did it were attending AUA, accessing union apprenticeships, also having staff meetings and talking to each staff about what are we going to do to get kids excited about what they're learning in school. And something we came up with is twice a week, every single student in high school gets to go to what we call clubs. They get 45 minutes where they get to go do just something they love. And some of the things we do is truck and auto, coding and design, basketball, film, nature is neat, campus, campus beautification, Spanish club, French club, card games and D&D. &D. In other words, we made our clubs during school so they don't have to stay after school. And this has really helped buy the staff into the STEM and the CTE programs because they're seeing the students getting excited about it. We also, as a group, we went to the board four times in one year just talking to them about expanding our CTE and our STEM programs. So because of that, we've been able to, now we have a wood shop, now we're making a machinist shop, we're making a maker space and we've added engineering to our courses and we're seeing the kids start to get really excited but still we keep also making sure the math the science the culinary all those people understand that every single thing they're teaching is important to the student and their end career in their job at the end also what we do besides the clubs is we offer classes that 
during school time at Mount Hood Community College, we have put together a class that um, any student at Corbett can go to. We have school Monday through Thursdays. This class is on a Friday. We can provide the transportation if they get to school. And they're going to be going to a seven week class that teaches the kids about CTE and STEM jobs. They're gonna visit six different types of STEM jobs in Mount Hood Community College. And they're going to be learning what it takes to um, achieve those jobs. They'll do it their junior and senior year. And then once they become seniors, we'll help them hopefully get Oregon Promise and it'll be a smooth transition in getting them trained so they can con continue and go get those, be a step ahead of everyone else and get those competitive jobs. Um, this started just with myself and a community service person at Mount Hood talking and I was telling her how you know we needed a class like that and it just started a little just us having a discussion one day and it grew to where now we have this class and we had to close it off because 28 students want to go to it and they can't take any more than that this time so we're hoping it'll continue and grow. Um, Michelle, you want to talk a little bit about your CTE and what you guys do? Because you do it a little bit differently than we do. Let's just hold back for a second for some questions here okay. before we move ahead. And while, while you think about a question and maybe raise your hand or put something in the chat, Charlotte helped out by defining what a hidden STEM career is and putting that in the chat for us. So for those who didn't read it or didn't see it, hidden STEM jobs are those that pay a living wage and do not require a four-year degree for an entry-level job unlike traditional STEM careers. So for example, she lists welders, electricians, solar technicians, healthcare technicians, like x-ray techs. Um, they typically require training beyond high school, but not four years of training ending with a bachelor in science or a bachelor of arts. All right, um, any questions about the introduction to those hidden STEM careers that, um, that we just heard? Okay. Maybe maybe give us tell us a brief story of a student that and how they ended up in a pathway like this to give us an example. Okay. Um, a brief story of a student would be we had a, a actually a student who did not graduate wasn't on track to graduate from high school, and we started getting them involved with a place called Impact Northwest. And I, I actually drove them there four times a week to Impact Northwest because we have transportation problems in Corbett. And he started getting excited about becoming um, a welder and a machinist. He just loved working with metals. He um, ended up graduate, he, he met me every Friday to do schoolwork so he could graduate. He got so excited and I just bumped into him. He was filling up his truck with gas. I bumped into the other day and he was just telling me that he, he just bought a truck. He's moved out on his own. He's so excited. He's working at a machinist shop out in Troutdale and that he just, it was a path that we planned out as a team and helped him achieve. And now he's working in a job he loves at a payable wage and he's well on his way to a um a competitive integrated employment so thanks kathy michelle do you have a quick story to share here um yeah i was just gonna say uh i had a student um he was in my first stem group and uh we took an in school field trip to look at our cte programs so oftentimes take my STEM, stu STEM eco students um, throughout the school to look at robotics club and the, meet the teacher and welding and wood shop um, because they don't always necessarily um, look at the curriculum guide or understand like what that class is really about. But when they go into the room and see the tools and the things that are built. Um, and so this student actually was a robotic student who helped give us a tour of the bot cave. Um, and, uh, after graduation was looking for a career, but did not want to go to college. Like his parents wanted him to go to college, but he did not want to go He's adamant. Um, that's always a fun position to be in. Right. Uh, and so what we did was, uh, we had taken some field trips in school and he specifically wanted to look at, um, heavy equipment, transportation and, uh, mechanic. And that's kind of hard sometimes when our students are under 18, um, and to get their foot in the door. After graduation, we teamed with the employment department 
Um, we sent him to a post-secondary training program that didn't work out. He came back and we did a um, work experience with um, our curry transfer and recycling heavy equipment operators, um, like truck driving and welding and um, you know the fixing of, of the big giant dumpsters. And that was great and all, but they, then COVID hit and there was no hire, it was a hiring freeze with our, um, with our local CTR. Uh, for a while. And so we ended up getting a job uh, as a lube tech um, at our local lumber mill, uh, working um, with big, big equipment. And he was so good at what he does uh, that they've already moved him up to heavy equipment mechanic three, I think. And so he is, he's literally um, just bought his first house this last year. Uh, it's a mobile home, but he bought it and it's all his. So, um, and, and he's a, you know, a kid who uh, fully capable of going to college didn't want to, had no interest whatsoever, um, but wanted to work and wanted to work with his hands. Um, and so uh, I would say in school field trips empowered him um, to have conversations with his peers and with um, adults and then um, exploring his community and looking at, you know, I, I could totally do that job is what got his foot in the door. Um, and then his work ethic is what kept him there. Awesome, thank you. Michelle, also something that we should talk about are the ways that we get kids um, into that place of where they're walking into the internships and the jobs. Because I know like at my school, what we do is we have the kids, there are students that just can't walk into an internship or an apprenticeship. They need the step beforehand. And the ways that we do that is at, at Corbett, we have them volunteer in um, Oregon Food Bank or our Corbett Food Bank, which we're both very involved in. And we start off there where the kids are learning to be on time, to be teamwork, transportation, to get there, to follow direction, to just follow a to-do list. And then we have job coaches there on site. So we make sure that it's um, they're being successful and they're positive. So it's very hands-on, very job-oriented, very job coach-oriented. And then as we back off, um, we start getting them internships out in the community after they graduate from that program into other programs. And we let the kids know about this. We have a huge bulletin board in Corbett that just talks about STEM, CTE, opportunities, internships and apprenticeships. And the kids are the ones who grab the information off and then they contact us, which you know, once they do that, they've bought into it a little bit. So um, that's one way that we get the word out there to our kids. But what do you do, Michelle, that gets the kids ready for those internships and apprenticeships. Absolutely. So all students um, at Breaking Star Arbor High School have access to our CTE program. So we've got welding, woodworking, small engine repair, medical pathways, digital graphics, and media. Um, we pretty much have it all, I feel like. Um, and so any student can participate in that. And then we also have our school-based businesses um, run by YTP and, and also run by other organizations and classes and all students um, can access those school-based businesses as well for some more of those like finite touches. Um, but what we, what I typically do um, as well is I work with our recruit hippo partners. So um, through our work source, we have a in-school um, talent advisor who comes twice a week to meet with any student who wants an internship, paid or unpaid, a work experience, paid or unpaid, in school youth, out of school youth, there's lots of, of people that they work with, um, but they work with our um, with our students. And I, I meet with her once a week. We staff our common students. I do referrals to recruit hippo if a student wants to try out a um, a hidden STEM career, wants to try out um, uh, exploring a different um, uh, job than maybe they're already placed in to see if there's something that's a little bit more um, aligned with their post secondary plans. And so it's a great way for students to get their foot in the door. And sometimes it's even paid, which is, is really cool for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of times it is paid. So talking about moving out into the community now. So after we have the kids do these in school businesses or volunteering in the programs that we have set up, then we start to move out to the community. Michelle and I do this a little bit different. I do it by mapping with adults. So we go out into the community in groups of two and we map different CTE and STEM jobs that are around the community. And we have a wide community because we're a charter school. And then we put them on a big map and we pin them. And then we have access to them. We also just send out a blank email to all staff members and say, hey, 
what do you, what did you do in your previous life? What does your spouse do for a job? You know, if you feel like sharing, please let us know. And then we make a running list of all these people and what they do out there in the world. And then we let the students know, we find out what they're good at by CIS assessment. And then we, I leave it to the student with support while I'm sitting there to contact either the business or the employee to start that opening up that conversation about what it takes to work at that place, which helps, helps with the self-advocacy piece. But we also um, really work with, you know, once you get a hold of those communities and where they are, those community partners and where they are, then as a transition specialist, you can start building that relationship and carving out jobs for students, certain students and start having that communication with them, possibly about summer works, where you'll have students that are available through summer works during your summer works program. And um, so that's that's a huge part of what I do is just working with those community members out there and having the students contact them and start a relationship with them by job shadowing or um, just even getting uh, just a phone call or a video call with them. And we um, it starts getting them excited about what they want to do. But you community map a little different than I do. I use staff and adults. You use students. So you want to talk about that, Michelle? Yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share a document with you guys as, or, or share my screen and just kind of show you um, a graphic organizer that I, I use. Um, I tweaked it a little bit just to make it more user friendly for my students. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. Um, so basically, uh, what I do is after uh, my students have done um, pretty much almost every CIS interest inventory or, or um, career exploration activity for, for the most part. So we spend quite a bit of time on assessments and sort of exploring who they are um, and what their interests are and their values. We then go into um, uh, sort of uh, grouping um, based on um, similar interests. So I always give the students the opportunity uh, to work by themselves on this process because some people are just more motivated to work independently. Um, they can work in partners or they can work in groups. Um, and uh, and so, you know, even this template might get tweaked a little bit for a student who's working by themselves or in a different group uh, uh, or in a larger group. Um, and so what they do is they uh, take a look at their um, their sort of cluster area, their big interest area, and they um, and then they decide where in my local community um, can I find out more about those hidden STEM um, jobs and careers of interest to me. And so um, using, uh, you know, the old days we'd use a phone book. They laugh at me when I say that now, uh, but we use Google a lot. Uh, we Google, um, you know, uh, fabrication and welding near me. Um, and so they start to take a look at who could I contact and what type of um, STEM learning area might it connect with um, in school. And then um, they, we also take a look at um, what, um, STEM career areas we might um, anticipate finding on site. Um, and um, sorry, do you guys, do you guys mind just taking it outside? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, someone popped in. And so uh, the other um, thing that we do is we take a look at how um, the student wants to explore this career. For some students, I have a student who wants to be a psychologist. Um, he didn't really feel like it would be appropriate to take a field trip there. Uh, he would much rather have the psychologist um, come to us as a guest speaker. So they, students get to choose sort of what type of um, field trip or exploration activity they would like um, to participate in and how it might best fit the, the project. So it could be anything from a guest speaker um, to a uh, a group that comes in every couple of weeks to meet with us. We had Southern Oregon Climate Action Now come in. Um, I, I believe it was like six times in a year to, to meet with students and do presentations on STEM careers. Um, we've done industry tours and field trips um, and sometimes job shadows. So it really depends on the student and how um, sort of intimately they wanna explore that career area um, and also the employer. So we've had with COVID, a lot of employers whose doors have been closed, but they're willing to take in one student or small groups. We've had employers that say, we can't really take anybody in, but we will, um, we'd be happy to give you a virtual tour or make a video with you. Um, or we would send one of our kennel techs in to talk to your class. 
So the students do the field trip, they fill out the graphic organizer, and then together we work through the process of planning um, this experience um, in class. So uh, everything from phone scripts, like how do you call um, a business and ask if we can come inside their doors? How do you contact a psychologist via email in a professional manner? And so that was literally my, my Friday um, activity was helping a student draft an email um, to how are we gonna get there? So we plan transportation together as a group. Are we gonna take um, a van supplied by the school? Are we taking a school bus because we're gonna be teaming up with Gold Beach? Are we taking, um, are we walking? We've done that before. Are we taking the city bus? And I don't tell them what to do. I just help guide them. I don't fill out their purchase orders. I don't fill out their transportation requests. They do it all themselves, um, just with some support from myself and my team. Um, they also have to calendar up together because we've had times where they've scheduled field trips at the exact same time. Do you guys have any questions about community mapping in general? Well, I was going to talk about team is important. You, when you said the team, they come to you and the team. I could not do what I do in STEM and everything without a team that helped talk the school board and helped talk the other teachers into buying into this. So um, I, it, it started out, our, t our team consists of um, a case manager, myself, um, a gen ed teacher, and a community member. And we just... Um, just started working at educating the other teachers at staff meetings and the school board at school board meetings and a team's very important because it can get overwhelming if you try to do everything by yourself i think um the employment department has also been great team members with us um just to look at community collaborators um everything from helping us get like who do we contact in this obscure career area locally um or how do we get up the coast um to helping us feed children when we went to accessing um the union trades um or accessing the uh union yeah. apprenticeships yeah accessing union apprenticeships um they help support us fiscally with that um and so uh, i was able to take students to canyonville to look at um trades trade careers uh and and i totally teamed up with my employment department on that one mm -hmm. And I think that's a great reminder for all of us that <clears throat> as transition specialists, you're not an island. You should never be forced to work alone and do everything by yourself. Try and identify who those best partners are to team up with and share the workload. Um, there, there are some really great people in our schools that we can partner with, whether that's in the CTE uh, departments, whether it's uh, gen ed teachers, special ed teachers, maybe some some local community members who really want to help students um, start building their future that that we can partner with and, and see how they can support you and what their strengths are and what they could bring to make make your YTP site successful and and help things move along. I agree. So thank you for all the information you, you guys rushed through what you were going to present a lot faster than I anticipated. Um, but, but I want to really open the door for a few minutes here and, and, and see, are there any questions? Do you want to learn any more about community mapping, about your CTE programs and how to partner with them, um, about hidden STEM uh, career pathways or, or about CIS? Anything that, that you feel like you have a question that you, you want to know more about um, before we close this? Gary? Yes, I've got a bunch of questions. I do too, um, but oh, wait. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm new to the to working in schools. My background has been mainly working with Volk Rehab as a uh, contracted job developer in the Portland area. Um, I've been doing that for 20 years, so I know that part of the job pretty well. But I'm having some uh, as a YTP specialist, which I do part time at a school that hasn't had a YTP specialist for quite some time. I'm kind of starting from scratch and uh, um, I'm, I'm open. I, I just want to be a student here and learn how you guys do it. This helps a lot just hearing some of the uh, uh, of, of this joining this group and hearing from you guys. Um, one question I had that came up early on was with uh, the unions and the A, I think it was the AUA that you mentioned. Because um, one of the problems I had up in Portland uh, 
in working with the unions and the apprenticeship program is I had one client who wasn't a, a student or anything, he was an older, an older person, but he was in the uh, painters union as an apprenticeship and uh, he was having trouble. He got so far in the program and he couldn't really advance from there uh, to a journeyman level. And I wanted to be able to advocate with, uh, with some of the unions in, in, the, in the Lane County area about, uh, you know, he had to leave the union because he couldn't advance. And, and a lot of their uh, apprenticeship programs, once you, if you don't continue to progress to a journeyman level, uh, he had to leave the union. And uh, I wanna work on that and see if there's not somewhere around that that we can uh, actually, he just couldn't paint fast enough to uh, meet the criteria, but he could do the, the prep work and the taping and all the other stuff. So uh, I think if I follow up with these guys, I might get some inroads into that. Would that be a recommendation? Well, I actually asked that question when I was up there because my kid, I'm far away. So if you know where Brookings is, yes, we are about as far from Portland as you could almost possibly be. Um, and so my big fear was housing because I don't have, there's no housing in my local community. So kids are excited to leave because they'd like to move out of their parents' homes. Imagine that. Um, and there aren't any homes for them to move into. So I asked about housing and then I asked about, cause my kids are sometimes scared to, to, to put their foot in the water and test the waters. If they think that once they do that, they have to jump in the pool. And so I asked, could you transfer from one union to the next? And they said, yes. Um, and so that would be my recommendation. If, if maybe that task isn't necessarily the task for someone to do, if, if a student's struggling within an apprenticeship, that they know that they can transition from one to the other. So maybe laborers union would be better because they, are, they have a lot of varied tasks that they do. Or maybe there's um, some skill sets that an individual might be really, really good at. Maybe not speed, but maybe they're accurate at something. And maybe another trade would value that. And so that's what I would start to look at is where are our skill strengths and deficits and who values that strength um, of that, that student or that client. Okay. Which is my recommendation. Takes us back to CIS. Yeah. It takes us back to CIS, um, assessing with that program, because it's very specific once you get into CIS on what jobs fit that student or that client. Yeah, several YTP uh, uh, coordinators have suggested that I use CTC, uh, 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 CIS uh, network to explore that kind of stuff. I plan on doing it. You mentioned also if you don't have that uh, access to it where you're at, how can you get onto it? Could you? Um, I would that? contact your VR counselor because they okay. they will probably be able to help you um, with an account because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but most VR offices have that have access okay. to that. The That's community correct. college in your local community may have access to it as well as does the employment department. So if you, I would start with your school and then your VR office and then go from there. Okay. But I'd be surprised if if one or not both of them have it. Yeah, and another thing that I do with students that I don't think are quite ready for the union in the point system, I will get them an apprenticeship or an internship with a non-union, you know, establishment, and I will have them start there, and I will have them use that as a jumping ground into a union once they get comfortable and learn a lot of the business or trade. Okay. All right, um, Megan had a question. Hi, uh, I'm Megan at Sherwood High School. And first of all, I'm really glad that you talked about CIS. I'm signed up to do the training tomorrow um, because my school actually does not use CIS, but I do have an account through my VR counselor. Um, so I'm gonna learn more. Um, but my question, I am just now starting to work with a male student, he's a junior, and he has, a very specific dream and goal of working for the railroad, like Union Pacific Railroad and doing like maintenance and repair. Um, and I don't know if you have any suggestions or I can maybe get your email um, on how we would do that. And like, if there are hidden STEM opportunities that are related to railroad. Funny thing is my father-in-law was a train conductor. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, so I, I definitely, I'll put my email in the chat, but I would love to um, collaborate with you on that. Uh, I don't have a railway in my town, uh, but I am excited to explore that with you. And their CIS or STEM, hidden STEM 
definitely in almost every job that a student does out there. I, I'm finding. I mean, it's it's just so much fun to explore it with a student and have the, their eyes, you know, get wide when they realize their math class is going to be relevant. Hey, hey Megan. Um, so I put a link in the chat um, for a um, a company that works in railroad construction, um, okay. and they, you know, it's a more of a travel thing, so you can go to tra travel. It's called a uh, Cooper's with a K, um, but yeah, you should look into that. And we're solving issues together. This is awesome. Uh, Angela, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I just wanted to tell a short little story about my experience using CIS because I've been using it now for a couple of years and I learned a lot just by doing the assessments and kind of just exploring on my own. Um, I haven't had a chance to do a training yet, but I'd like to. And um, one thing that really helped me in working with students is getting a staff account for CIS, which is possible if your school has like, um, um, like an account and um, they're able to add you as one of like the, the, the staff that are using it. And um, if you take a CIS training, you'll learn a little bit more about how, what, how it works to have a staff account. But what's cool about it is that you can check on the progress of all of the portfolios in your school. So if you're working with your YTP students, you have them all in one place and you can see their saved resumes, anything they've put in their portfolio um, through that staff account. So um, I definitely explore that as a next step once you get rolling in CIS is to see if you can get a staff account. So you have a little more admin kind of tools. And um, so that has been a game changer for me. Hey, Garrett, yes. on the YTP site, is there the dates listed for CIS trainings? No, but Kia put them in the chat. Oh, did she? Look at their their webinar descriptions, um, and then if you go to see it, to the CAS website, I'll pop that in the chat in just a second. Here, they have a training um, site in there with a calendar that um, has all the trainings they offer included. Can I show you guys one more resource in Oregon CIS specific to the the railroad railroad question? Go ahead. Cool. So um, I was just curious to see what I could find. Um, so while you pose that in between when you pose that question and just now, uh, what I did was I went into explore resources. I went into occupations and I looked at the alphabetical list. And it may not be exactly accurate to what your student is interested in, but it did take me down a rabbit hole that I think would be helpful. Um, I looked for railroad brake signal and switch operators, which was what I could find under railroad. And then if you go down to the left-hand side, I clicked on resources. And now I've got some resources here that I could you know, explore further with my student to find more information about um, this type of occupation. Um, interestingly enough, when I clicked down on some of these resources, they weren't necessarily linking me to anything that was helpful. But um, you can look at uh, programs of study for certain occupations that'll help you look at certificate programs you know, um, or community college programs or university programs um, and graduate level programs that a student might go down to um, reach a certain occupation. Um, and so you can even start to look at Oregon schools versus schools outside the state. Um, but I just thought I would see what I could find under, the, I've never had anyone interested in the railroad. Um, and so if you go into um, occupations and then R for railroad, um, and you find railroad brake signal and switch operators on the left-hand side, you can find some information under resources. The hard part sometimes with CIS is when you can't find a certain career title, you have to sort of look at where it might be hidden um, or use the search um, function to find it. Uh, for example, uh, for a while there, it was hard to find uh, tattoo training programs because they were lumped under cosmetology, which wasn't necessarily something my kids were interested in doing. 
Thanks, Michelle. Um, so the link that Kia posted is the link to the training calendar on the on the CIS website. And Kia has her hand up, so go ahead, Kia. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I was just going to say um, it was really nice uh, back in, which is the first time that I had a YTP uh, focused training with, C, uh, with CIS, which was really nice. Um, so if anybody has not been trained um, on it, um, please register for the YTP focused one. Um, it was really nice too, as, as long as I've been in this position, which is my fifth year, um, I've never received that kind of training or information um, with CIS. And so for, for us here in Portland Public Schools, being that each uh, transition specialist has two high schools, so it's interesting that each of us have a very different, we do have a staff account um, within our school. So I have two different accounts for the schools that I support. Um, but yes, it allows me to see different things. And then Mary Thorpe, I think that's how you say her name. Uh, she really did some great work with us individually in helping us set up. Um, I did request it from her <laughs> if she would be willing to do that with us, but um, to help us kind of formulate our what our assessments look like um, for our schools, for, for us, it was just very different for each of us. So um, she was willing to do that if, if you ask her. Um, so that was really nice. And so it, it's been able, oh, I have been able to uh, improve my assessments and what I'm doing with students and, and getting them connected to different opportunities. So definitely do the YTP focus training. And thank you, Kathy and Michelle, for bringing this up today. Yes. It's wonderful stuff. One thing that I love is as I'm reading these comments, I just clicked on them, is this is what happens at our school when we start to ask people what their past lives were or what their spouses do or whatever. It's, it's just so fun because you all of a sudden start having people come up and say, oh, I did this or I did that. And it's, it's fascinating to me. Not only do the students get excited to see that we as teachers are people, but, um, and we've done other things besides being, you know, in the school system, it, it's just, it, it has just, it blossoms into this wonderful resource out into the community where you can find out about different jobs and have students have a foot up by someone who's in the business already. And um, I think it's a, it's a great tool to do is just to find out who does, who does what, or who has done what. <laughs> Um, um, one thing I wanted to say is Mary Tharp, who, who folks have been talking about, was a former transition specialist who works for CIS, which is why she has this great knowledge um, to put out there. And if you happen to be, um, you're not sure if your school has it, has CIS, what's going on with that, ask, ask your TAP and we can find out for you. Um, what you, you know, who has it, we can find out who's the administrator from within your school. Um, we can help you with all of those things. And when in doubt, reach out to your VR counselor because they always can, should be able to get access to, uh, to CIS. And if they can't, let us know and we will, we'll work our back alleyways to make things happen. Eileen has her hand up for a question or a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that if your school doesn't have CIS, like we don't, but they have Naviance, that Naviance now includes all the CIS sorts. So your students, especially if they are looking to go to college, then they can have all their college information there, their scholarships, and all their um, in interests and career sorts and stuff all there together. So that's another option. And, and I know that that's not the topic of the discussion for today, but also in Oregon CIS in that same um, tab that I showed you guys uh, exploring resources, um, you can get connected directly to the Oregon State Library and there's GED practice tests and prep, there's um, citizenship um, practice exams, cosmetology. I mean, you name it, they pretty much SATs, ACTs, so there's like a whole nother resource that we didn't really want to open that can because we didn't have enough time today. Um, but but I've been using um, the GED prep 
and pre-assessments with a lot of my students um, since COVID has left some of them uh, extremely credit deficient. I'll just be honest. There's a, a, you know, a bunch of kids that are on track right now. Well, Corbett uses it for college bound students because it just directs you to the college that's perfect for the student. I mean, it's an amazing resource on both sides in the education field and also going straight into employment. Um, there's a question in the chat about YTP specialists working with middle school students. Um, I'm under the impression that I'm not supposed to work with middle school students. Um, it's very rare that I work with students um, uh, in eighth grade. It would have to be like an older eighth grader, but I typically don't work with students until they get to me as freshmen. That's just my district and how they do it. Well, we the reason why Corbett works with eighth graders, we have our high schools 10, 11, and 12. And then in on our high school campus, we have an eight nine academy. So we start as we that we were just assessing at ninth grade, but we found the need that the students needed to be assessed in eighth grade, and then again in at least tenth, and then again, you know. So um, we do start assessing them in eighth grade, so we can make that four year path for them. And Oregon CIS has high school licensures and then they have middle school license. So some schools may have both of those licenses, have purchased both, and some may only um, have the high school version. Um, our middle school does utilize Oregon CIS. And so I totally believe eighth graders should be doing it. It's just not, not a role I play. I think that's a, a bigger question to look at your career center and how your school district talks about career pathways overall and not just as YTP transition specialists. So yes, in theory for, for our YTP transition specialists, you get into the picture a little bit later, but that doesn't mean that students can't access these tools earlier. Right, because transition isn't just the transition specialist, it's the district, so yeah. That's a great thing to say to close out our meeting. It is just about three o'clock. I wanna thank you all for your time that you spent with us today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and a great week. We will see you again in March. Thanks.